I first want to say that I didn't start out intentionally sewing a ball gown, but I just got a little carried away with all the lace and bows. Hi, I'm Dixie and I sew historical costumes and I want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, you. More on that in a minute, so bear with me as I do a quick little bit of backstory. I was recently invited to a mid-Victorian themed costuming event and it would be my first event since last February. So naturally I was very excited to see my friends again. And I have an 1840s day dress, but I thought I should probably wear something a little bit dressier for the occasion, which necessitated a new costume. And since I am both cheap and lazy, I did not want to make a hoop skirt. So that meant no late 1850s or 1860s dresses. So I decided to dive right back into the 1840s, the age where women learned their lessons from the 1830s, slimmed their sleeves, lowered their top knots and their hemlines. And this is where you come in. I had just started making a little bit of ad revenue from this channel, so I used it to buy supplies for this dress, specifically six yards of silk taffeta. So thank you so much for watching this channel, for leaving comments, for liking and sharing and supporting me. I feel like the entire theme of this dress is friendship because I made it to go visit with friends. The vintage lace on the dress was gifted to me by a friend and you, all my, virtual internet friends helped make it happen. So thank you again and let's get to sewing. I'm using a pattern from Laughing Moon Mercantile. Laughing Moon is great in that they have a very wide size range and all the sizes are included in one pattern, but that makes for a lot of pattern pieces to wrangle. I chose to buy the print at home version because I'm impatient and I was on a strict deadline, but what I didn't notice is that this PDF pattern is only available in copy shop size, so it's not tiled to print on a home printer. Now I was able to use Adobe Reader to tile the pieces, but I still had to print out every page on one of these giant sheets just to get the single pattern piece I actually needed. So after cutting two giant sheets for two pattern pieces, I did what any rational person who has access to Adobe Illustrator would do. I edited the pattern files to pick out just the pattern pieces I needed and print them separately. This is probably against the terms of use, but I simply could not justify printing out 40 plus pages for the remaining tiny bodice pieces I needed for my mock-up. So here we have the four pieces I need for this bodice. And here are the 11 pieces that I printed out for no reason. Now that that's done, I could actually cut out my mock-up fabric. I'm using cotton muslin, which if all goes well, can be used as a lining. Because I learned my lesson from my last big project to not use loosely woven linen for a mock-up slash lining fabric. I'm also in between sizes in this pattern, so I'm cutting the higher size because again, after my last big project, I'm paranoid about making things too small. I'm doing the straight sleeves because those were popular for this time period, but I'm making them a little wider because my arms are usually bigger compared to the rest of my torso. The bodice features curved darts, which you don't often see in modern garments. I find it difficult to sew these types of darts by machine, so I'm basting by hand. I generally hate sewing darts. It's my least favorite aspect of sewing, so these curved darts are especially annoying. It would be such a shame if I did all of this hand sewing for no reason whatsoever, so it's a good thing I did it, right? We shall see. My first mock-up was way too big. Looks like I overcompensated on the sizing, so I slimmed everything to the next size down. And mock-up round two. In, in general, it fits better, except I'm still big in the waist. But I realized my inspiration dress had piped seams in the front. However, there are only two darts in this bodice and all three are piped. But this has two darts on either side. And I think that's just gonna be too cluttered um, and too many piped seams. So while this bodice still has a few more other fit issues, I think what I'm actually gonna do is I'm going to print out the view D of this pattern because it has princess seam lines. And then there will only be two seams on either side instead of four. <laughs> this is the first test fit. <laughs> so the mock-up stage has gone on for what feels like ages at this point of me just making tweaks here and there, but 
here's the thing. Mock-ups aren't pretty to look at or to watch, and it's kind of disheartening when I go through like five iterations, changing sizes and corsets, only to end up with pattern pieces that look almost exactly like the pieces I originally started with. But mock-ups can be frustrating, but they are absolutely necessary. You should totally do them. But let's just move on to the pretty fabric. So after living in mock-up hell for about a week, it was time to cut into the good fabric, but we need to clear off our workstation. Now, y'all know that my nemesis is the pile, but I really don't feel like cleaning up right now, so yeah. I guess I can't blame all my messes on the baby. My color scheme was inspired by this early 1840s dress from the Met. So I bought some bronzy shot silk from the main fabric that has gold threads running one way and red the other. Well, I've got most of the bodice cut out, but I realized I already made a mistake. I cut this back panel based on um, where the pieces will overlap, not where I should technically cut them, which should be wider. So it's a, a good thing that I left a little bit extra room in the back because I'm gonna need it now because now I need to cut an extra facing for this. The other fabric I bought was a red and black shot taffeta for the contrast piping which I'm making by cutting bias strips, sewing the ends together, and wrapping them around some narrow cotton cord. I tore apart mock-up number 76 to use as a lining for the bodice, and I'm adding piping to most of the seams. I'm basically following my inspiration dress as a piping guide. So I find it charming that the back of this bodice is pieced in at least three places. Which is reassuring because remember that little mishap I had in the back? I had to cut some strips from scrap pieces to piece the back facing together. I'm adding more piping to the armholes and the neckline. Well, I have the base of the bodice assembled and mostly piped. I've already tacked down the piping at the neckline, and then I'm gonna add some lace behind that. But I'm gonna have to take a break for now because the baby woke up from her nap. The last bit of bodice piping goes on the waistline, but before I could do that, I needed to add boning channels. And I'm going with my handy dandy cotton twill tape along with synthetic whalebone. But of course, you can never just do the one thing you need to do. You always have to do some other little fiddly thing first. And I had to tack down the seam allowances. By hand, of course. From here on out, most of this dress is done by hand. Only then could I sew the boning channels in place and insert the bones. Okay, I've got my bodice interior finished except for the sleeves. And I really wanna work on the applied Bertha next. It's only gonna go in the front. But to do that, I won't know how much fabric I have to work with until I cut the skirt. So I'm going to do that next. I am not the kind of person who buys extra fabric just to be safe. I buy the barest of minimums and pray I have enough because silk is expensive. At first I thought I could just tear this fabric, but it started to get snags, which is not good. So instead I did the method of pulling out one single thread and cutting along the line it leaves behind. To add some structure to the skirt, I thought I'd try interlining it with Tarleton, which is a stiffened open weave cotton fabric that was only $2 a yard. So I bought probably way too much because now I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to use all of this for? It's really stiff and unwieldy to work with. It's also much narrower than the width of my silk, so I have to piece sections of it together. And oh, look, the pile at the end of the table hath returned. It was at about this point that I realized I probably made a terrible mistake in using this stuff. I hadn't even gotten it attached to the silk yet, and it was already a hot mess to work with. But I pressed on and started basting the tarlatan to the skirt panels. Okay, I am really starting to second guess this tarlatan decision because it is so stiff and just unruly and I'm using such large pieces of it. 
I don't see how I'm going to get this under the machine. Just trying to piece the segments together. That alone was a challenge. I think the better idea would probably be to do cotton organdy, but I don't have any of that. I don't want to leave it unlined, but I don't want to weigh it down with muslin. I did end up ordering some cotton organdy and shifted to work on the bodice in the meantime. I really wanted to make the bertha next, that pleated section that goes over the bust, but once again, I realized I needed to finish the sleeves before I could do that part. This lace is pretty narrow, so to make the most of it, I whipped it in place by hand. This cream lace, along with the other lace I'm using in this dress, is vintage and was kindly gifted to me by a friend, so I'm glad I'm making use of it. This lace and the lace on the neckline are obviously machine made, and I'm not sure if a lace of this style would have been readily available in the time period. To finish up the base bodice, I needed a back closure. In the 1840s, there seems to be a mix of lacing and hooks and eyes. I think the hooks might have been an older method because you rarely see them in evening dresses of the 1850s and 60s, but they're quite common in the 30s. I'm going with hooks because they're quicker to sew for me and I don't have to try to find random thread and silk lacing ribbon on the internet to match my dress. But because of my little cutting mishap earlier, my center back is going to have a pieced panel. But oh well, piecing is period. Just to test the fit, I basted in some hook and eye tape, then replaced it with the real hooks. If only sewing the hooks were that fast. So my cotton organdy came in and I took off all of the tarlatan from the silk. So now I just have to replace it with this. Well, I realize I made a mistake. I did not order enough organdy fabric. And I realized what went wrong. I was thinking, oh, I need three panels worth of fabric. So I just ordered three yards, even though my skirt pieces are longer than a yard. So I'm gonna have to order some more. Luckily it came in pretty quickly, but in the meantime, I can at least baste two panels together while I order more fabric. Well, now after doing literally everything else to this bodice, I finally get to work on the one part I was really excited about, the Bertha. So I started cutting bias strips according to the pattern instructions when I discovered another issue. So it seems that front only Berthas were common in the 1840s and in the 50s and 60s, you really see the Berthas that go all the way around the shoulders. So my Bertha is only gonna go in the front of the dress because I only have enough lace to trim the front. The pattern has an option for a front only Bertha that they're calling an applied Bertha. Thing is, if I wanted to have done this, I should have done it before adding the sleeves. But that's not exactly what I wanted to do. I actually want a separate Bertha on top that is attached at the shoulders and center front. But to do that, I would have needed to take a big panel of fabric and pleat it down, which, at this point, I didn't even have a big enough panel to do anyway, as I had already cut all of the rest of the bias strips. So that meant I basically had to stitch these bias strips together now. I did a little test run of my bias strip Bertha arrangement, then carefully transferred it to my table to baste everything together. This part was really annoying because I had to sew all of the strips together for real this time, by hand without any stitches showing from the right side, and I was really wishing I had enough fabric left to do the big pleated panel instead, but oh well, it's done. Next came adding lace, and I think this is the real showstopper portion of this Bertha. It's another vintage piece from my friend's collection, and it looks like it was salvaged from a garment or something. I've also never seen anything like it. It looks like a very fine, narrow cord carefully attached to a net base. It's very delicate and actually has a snag in the net in one spot, which caused the cord to unravel. So I took my closest matching thread and did my best to repair it. Now 
Now I needed a means of securing the Bertha to the dress. Piped tabs were a popular option, so I took some scraps and sewed more piping to the edges. Well, the rest of the organdy came in, so we are back in business. Now, cotton organdy is pretty stiff and bulky, but it was at least easier to work with than the tarlatan. And I was so eager to sew up my skirt that I completely forgot to add the pocket. So I'm doing that a little after the fact. Next came pleating, and even though I always start out by calculating my pleats, I'll inevitably end up eyeballing the pleats several times before I get something I'm satisfied with. Like my inspiration dress, I'm going with chunky wide knife pleats that angle toward the center. And this is the part where I should clarify that I'm doing things a little out of order. The way you're supposed to hem skirts of this era is to finish the straight bottom edge first, then level out the skirt when you attach the pleats to the waist. But my cheap dress form is useless and wouldn't stay upright long enough to do that. So I'm doing the pleats first and then sticking the dress on the form and hemming last. And yes, I am watching Bridgerton while finishing this dress and I have... opinions. I'm hemming by hand with a catch stitch, and please don't think this is the best technique for doing this. The skirt was bulky and hard to maneuver, and I was trying my best to only catch the organdy and not the taffeta at the right side of the fabric with varying amounts of success. I knew I wanted to add some ribbon bows as that was a popular trim for the time. The bows are made by gathering loops of ribbon and layering them together. This ribbon is a vintage rayon. I like using vintage ribbons because the rayon of the mid 20th century was actively trying to mimic the look of silk ribbon and it does a pretty good job. I am just smitten with this dress. It's much more dressed than I originally planned on making, and I am sure I'll be way overdressed for my event, but I think it turned out really well, and I think the bows really make the dress. I like the silhouette. The skirt is huge, thanks to three petticoats and the organdy interlining. The hem has that perfect low 1840s sweep. And overall, the bodice has a decent amount of wiggle room. In fact, it wasn't until I was strapped into the dress when I realized I had forgotten to tie my corset laces, so it's all loosey-goosey in there. That being said, the weight of the dress was still putting strain on those back hooks and eyes, so after this, I went back and did a better job of anchoring down both the closures and the extra panels of silk that were at the center back. This is why it's so important to try on the costume before the event. Oh, and because of the way the skirt panels were arranged, my pocket is awkwardly toward the front. Which is fine. And it's much easier to sew a pocket into a seam line than cutting a whole new pocket slit anyway. The only issue with fit is the sleeves are a little tight. I think after adding all of the layers of piping and lace, it made the fabric thicker than my single layer mock-up, but it's not unwearable. I still had some ribbon left over, so I made this headpiece, and I'll show how I did that and my inspiration for it in a future video, so subscribe if you want to see that. I was hoping I could add some fun event footage in this section, but we thought it would be best to postpone the event for a while, so I'm sure I'll be able to wear the dress at some point, but Instead of that, I wanted to take these last few minutes to talk about some lovely people who are also costumers and who would have attended this event with me. One of our hosts, Laura, is a fantastic interior designer and creative historical costumer. She also does educational content, beautiful crafts, and decor projects. Her videos are just really soothing to watch. I love it. The other host, Megan, has the best channel name ever, Clusterfrock. She does clever and often budget-friendly costumes. She's done a bunch of one-day makes and historical sewing challenges with Walmart supplies. And she just makes all around some of the most fantastic costumes. 
and I haven't yet met Denise in person, but I am looking forward to it. She's a living history interpreter and she does a lot of cool historic recipes for food and remedies on her channel, Time Travel is Possible. And if you're not already, you should follow her on Instagram for perfectly aesthetic photos paired with inspiring quotes. If we ever do all get together, you can be sure that I will tell you all about it here. Thank you again for watching and supporting the channel. It really gives me the motivation to keep making things. See you next time. But surprisingly, it seems to fit better up here too. Yes, are you helping? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes.